again. And Lydia says, are you ashamed of what you've done? Are you? I think we have to remember what situation this country was facing. We were going into the winter with people uh, expected to face fuel bills of up to £6,000, huge rates of inflation. And you've made it worse. But also slowing, slowing economic growth. And what we've done is we've taken action to make sure that from this weekend, people won't be paying a typical fuel bill of more than £2,500, not just this year, but also next year. But isn't that cancelled that out by the fact inflation. that you've made, you're making inflation work with the measures that you have brought in on Friday in the mini budget? People are worried about their mortgages and they're tearing their hair out over their pensions. I've got so many messages, Liz. This will curb inflation by up to 5%. When? What we're also doing is taking action this winter. Well, Liz Strauss spoke to eight local radio stations. Each one had five minutes and presenter after presenter put the concerns of their listeners directly to the Prime Minister. This was BBC Radio Stoke. Our people are worried about their mortgages and worried about when their fixed term ends whether they'll be able to afford a new deal. And that will dwarf any of the savings that you've made doing anything else. You've, you've, you've done this yourself. This isn't to do with external forces. This is about your mini budget and what it's done to the economy. Well, interest rates are a matter for the Independent Bank of England. And the fact is that in response to the global economic situation, interest rates have been rising around the world. So they've gone up in the United States, uh, they're going up in other countries, but they are a matter for the Independent Bank of England here in Britain. The Bank of England have had to bail out the, the, your decisions yesterday. The Bank of England have had to step in. The International Monetary Fund have said that they don't think what you've done is a good idea. The, is it time to reverse what you've done, bearing in mind what you've seen over the last few days, the damages caused to the pound? Well, no, it isn't, because the vast majority or the majority of the package we announced on Friday was the support on energy. Well, the local radio station round of interviews is a tradition for party leaders before their annual conferences. For the Conservatives, that begins this weekend. But the cost of living crisis is overshadowing it. There are fears that both inflation and interest rate rights could rise faster than predicted off the back of the mini-budget at a time when inflation is already at a 40-year high. Well, Liz Truss, though, had a clear message. Here she is on BBC Radio Bristol. I and the Chancellor have taken decisive action to deal with that. From this weekend, the energy bill price guarantee comes in, so people will be facing no more than £2,500 for a typical energy bill. We've also taken action to reduce our tax burden and spur Yeah, but pr Prime Minister, with projects, respect, that so is we the get same economic scripted answer you've given going. to every BBC local radio station this morning. You've got the Bank of England stepping in now to try and clean up a mess. A government has caused that has never happened. We have a very, very difficult economic global situation because of the war that Vladimir Putin has perpetrated in Ukraine. And countries are under pressure yeah, but this world, isn't this isn't Putin. This isn't just about Putin. I mean, your chancellor on Friday opened up the stable door and spooked the horses so much you can almost see the economy being dragged behind them. Well, it's been a dramatic week, so let's uh, just recap ourselves what's been going on. On Friday, the UK Chancellor unveiled that mini-budget with the biggest tax cuts in 50 years, as well as increasing borrowing. That rattled the markets. The same day, the pound fell dramatically against the US dollar. On Sunday, Krasi Kwarteng said that more cuts were coming. On Monday, the pound hit a record low. By Tuesday, mortgage lenders began pulling deals, while pension funds, which invest in government bonds, were, were forced to start selling even as prices started falling. Next came this statement by the International Monetary Fund criticising the UK government, saying, we do not recommend large and untargeted fiscal packages at this juncture, as it's important that fiscal policy does not work at cross-purposes to monetary policy. Then on Wednesday, the Bank of England was forced to intervene to calm the markets. As Bloomberg reported, the Bank of England was concerned that margin calls would cause a guilt crash. The guilt being UK government 
bonds. Well, watching all of this unfold has been the former Bank of England governor, Mark Carney. There, there is a lapse between or a lag between um, today and when that growth might come. That's the first inconsistency that's there. Secondly, um, there was an undercutting of some of the institutions uh, that underpin um, the overall approach. So uh, not having an OBR forecast, it's much commented upon, and the government, I think, has accepted uh, the need for that, but that that was important. Um, working at some cross purposes with the bank in terms of short-term um, support for the economy or withdrawal of support for the economy, that's another challenge. Uh, and then I think the third thing is what's left out of the budget, and it was a self-described mini budget, um, so maybe this is understandable, but the real measures that were going to drive the acceleration of growth that's necessary for the numbers to add up, and of course we don't have all the numbers, so you can't tell that it's, uh, they, whether or not they add up, and so that leads to one last uncertainty and concern, which is, well, maybe the way the numbers are going to add up is through spending cuts, as yet unspecified, and what would those be and how are those going to be put in place? Mark Carney there, critical of the government's decision not to publish an independent forecast on the impact of its economic plans alongside Friday's mini-budget, which experts say made the market reaction worse. Meanwhile, on the local radio stations, the grilling continued. Here's Liz Truss on BBC Tees. The government has taken decisive action to help families and businesses with their energy bills this winter. And we've also taken decisive action to get the economy growing and get Britain moving. And that is what ultimately will help all of us pay our bills. But what it's kind like of decisive action, Prime Minister? Because your decisive action so far has knocked 40% off people's pensions. So what, what decisive action are we talking about here? We are facing a global economic crisis following Putin's appalling war in Ukraine. Well, across all the radio interviews this morning, Liz Truss constantly returned to the government having moved quickly to ease energy bills on families. And later on today, it was time to face the regional television editors. I mean, look, I understand it's difficult times for people and we're facing a difficult winter. Interest rates have always been set since 1997 by the Independent Bank of England. And that's a really important principle. Politicians don't get involved in setting interest rates. And what we are seeing is interest rates are going up around the world. Well, Liz Truss wasn't the only one defending her government's tax-cutting plans. Here's the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Chris Philp, on the Today programme. In the last six to nine months, we've seen global financial markets suffer a lot of volatility. We've seen a huge dollar strength against the yen, the euro and sterling. We've seen interest rates rising uh, across the globe. And in fact, interest rates in other countries like the USA have increased by more than they've increased here. And we've seen, you mentioned Bank of England intervention. They're obviously independent. You're, and they you're may... not, Sorry, I'm going to stop you because you're not addressing what I'm asking about. And that is what we've seen in the last few days. People are really well, worried. What is happening is frightening for many people, whether they hold mortgages, whether they're savers, whether they've yeah. got a, a, a pension and they want to be sure yeah. that you know what okay, you're well, doing ask, and that you're answer. not crashing the economy. Let so me... did you foresee this well, reaction? Let me, let me just answer the question fully. So this is not the only uh, country where there has been volatility. The Bank of Japan just a few days ago had to intervene exceptionally in the yen uh, dollar market. So Chris Philp there drawing comparisons between the Bank of England's intervention and what the Bank of Japan did last Thursday. But according to our colleagues at BBC Business, there are two very different operations there. The Bank of England launched a £65 billion intervention to buy government debt and protect the UK's financial stability and some types of pension funds, while the Japanese move, which was reportedly worth $21 billion, that's £19 billion, although unusual, was more orthodox and was aimed at supporting the value of its currency, the yen, by selling US dollars and buying up yen. Japanese action did not prompt quite such ferocious market reaction as the Bank of England's interjection. So, not quite the same. Well, we also heard from the UK Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng. What we're focusing on is delivering the growth plan and making sure, with things like our energy intervention, that people right across this country are protected. And without growth, you're not going to get the public services. We're not going to generate the income and the tax revenue 
to pay for the public services that we want to see. And that's why the mini budget was absolutely essential in resetting the debate around growth and focusing us on delivering much better growth outcomes for our people. So no sign of a U-turn there. The opposition Labour Party, well, unsurprisingly, very critical. They are calling on the Chancellor's next economic statement, which is expected on the 23rd of November, to be brought forward. Here's the Labour Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. This was a reckless act of choice, which has wreaked havoc in financial markets, beginning with a sharp drop in the value of the pound, which makes our imports more expensive, uh, then going into the mortgage market, which you've been discussing, where hundreds of products have been withdrawn uh, and the price of others has increased sharply. Uh, and yesterday, we had the extraordinary intervention from the Bank of England to stop major pension funds from going off a cliff. So how is all of this being viewed at Westminster? Let's get reaction from our political correspondent Zoe Conway on the government's message. They're trying to still talk about how Britain is not an outlier in all of this, that there are problems in economies all over the world. And so they're really trying to keep the sort of the focus on problems within global markets, that there's nothing unique or idiosyncratic, sorry, nothing unique um, about what's going on here in Britain. But another thing I think they're trying to do today is to reset the conversation around that so-called mini budget. What they feel has got lost is that there was an awful lot of support, of support in that mini budget for people um, on low incomes and people struggling with their energy bills. Zoe Conway there. Now, just two more developments to add. The OBR says it's been asked by the Chancellor to produce a first draft of its next economic forecast by the 7th of October. And while we wait for that, a YouGov poll just out has put Labour in a 33-point lead ahead of the Conservatives, the highest ever recorded poll since the 1990s. Well, let's discuss all of this with the Financial Times' Whitehall editor, Sebastian Payne. Where do we start? I mean, since this mini-budget, Sebastian, we've had a lot of drama, a lot of development, a lot of turmoil, and not a lot of Liz Truss. Today, however, we have heard a lot from the Prime Minister, speaking to many of the local radio stations and television stations across the BBC. What's your assessment? How did she do? I think in future years, when students are looking at media studies, they will go back through that catastrophic hour of media interviews as a study of how not to do prime ministerial and political communications that the BBC has very helpfully edited them all together into one podcast. And I listened to it on my way home this evening, and it's actually far worse listening to them all together than individually. The prime minister refused to engage with the seriousness of the situation and try to stick to a set of allotted Sound bites. And I thought was actually a brilliant example of the BBC's local journalism that the reporters from Nottingham, Kent, Tees were able to put very specific local concerns to the Prime Minister. And she just struggled to have answers. And she tried to paint this as an international global situation to do with Ukraine, um, to do with the, out the, um, the end of the COVID pandemic, completely refusing to acknowledge that this particular issue in the UK is because of that mini budget that Kwasi Kwarteng held on Friday, which I think, again, like those interviews, will go down historically as a catastrophic fiscal event. Yes, all those interviews brought together by the newscast team and my colleague Adam Fleming, all available on uh, BBC Sounds, of course. And as uh, Sebastian's saying, really worth listening to all of those together. When it comes to the messaging, though, we've heard that Kwasi Kwarteng has been asking MPs to be supportive and they've got some, some helpful hints as to how, how to describe that mini budget and the kind of plans that they're trying to put forward. Yes, and again, obviously, the government is in obviously in crisis management over this over this situation, and having sort of essentially tried to declare war on the markets and have found that international capital markets can't be swiped away quite easily. They're trying to get two MPs to take to social media to say essentially they're sticking with the plan, they're not changing, they're not going to U-turn. But I think the most curious thing after that 
text that Kwasi Kwarteng sent out to all Conservative MPs is how few of them have taken up on his generous offer, that they've not taken to Twitter, they've not been hitting the TV studios trying to sell this package because, as well as being economically um, a catastrophe, it's deeply unpopular, the idea of, of cutting the top rate of 45p tax. Politically, it's something that Conservative chancellors have looked at for much of the past decade, but have always shied away from because of the impact it will have on the party's poll rating. That brings us to the thing you mentioned at the top there, which is that YouGov poll with a 33 lead for the Labour Party. We haven't seen those numbers since the dire days of John Major's government in about September 1996, I think. And that will set the jitters among MPs and had Liz Trust been Prime Minister longer than I think it's been three weeks, then you would be talking about, is she going to be heaved out? And even though um, two MPs seem to be addicted to regicide...